We've got two pretty intense topics coming up, so it would be sort of nice if we could take a break. And hey, it turns out there's this topic, which really should have just been a few slides at the end of the last lecture, but there's so many images embedded in it that I had to keep it in its own deck of slides. So I guess that's the sign we've been waiting for. Let's take a nice break, let's relax a little bit and talk about subsampling. Uh, and I'll start by talking about, again, this RGB representation that we've been using. There's our image of a pear. Notice that this is an image that's very heavy in greens. It's got lots of different shades of green. And each pixel is represented in an RGB representation by this triple of red, green, and blue values. Each value is between 0 and 255, or between 0 and some maximum, although in our context we'll use 0 and 255. We'll assume we're using 8 bits per sample. What we could do, though, is we could take each of the red values and extract them and create a grayscale image. We could take each of the green values and blue values and do the same. So we now have a 2D array of just the red component and a 2D array of just the green component and so on. And because what we end up having is basically a grayscale image, so it's a 2D array of values between 0 and 255, where 0 is the least intense and 255 is the most intense or most bright, we can actually view each of these channels once we've extracted them, each of these color planes, as its own image, which is sort of a nice way to notice um, how the detail breaks down between the three colors in the RGB representation. It shouldn't surprise us that in this image, which is very heavy on the green, and where differences uh, between uh, parts of the image are often determined by differences between shades of green. So for example, we've got the body of the pear, uh, it, which is one shade of green, and then the grass in the background, which is some other shade of green. And we'll notice that that distinction is really obvious in the green channel, if we only look at the, at the green value of each pixel, whereas we don't see that much of a distinction in red or blue because these two shades of green may not differ that much in terms of their red or blue components. Um, so these are monochromatic images. We can actually view the red channel as what would happen if we just filtered the entire image to only look at shades of red and then render it in grayscale because that allows us to compare the red channel to the green channel. Really, to create the original image again out of the three channels, what I would have to do is tint this channel red and this channel green and this channel blue and then overlay them on top of each other. Um, but by rendering them in grayscale, it allows me to compare the color, the, the, the details associated with each color channel. So one observation I will make uh, to counteract something that's coming up is part of the reason the green channel has so much more detail than red and blue is because the original image is full of greens. On the other hand, human vision very heavily favors green. Uh, human eyes are very good at distinguishing different shades of green. They can obviously distinguish shades of red and blue as well, but not as um, finely as they could distinguish shades of green. I believe uh, human vision is much worse at distinguishing blue than any of the other colors, if, if we decide to use an RGB representation. And we should think right now, why do we do that? Why are we insisting on storing pixels as red, green, and blue values? Why are those our primary colors? Or why do we insist on storing a pixel as a mixture of primary colors? Aren't there other ways to break this down? And that's the point of this lecture. So human vision heavily favors green. If we're talking about colors, um, we're able to notice differences in green much more than differences among shades of other colors. But I should also observe that our eyes are very good at um, distinguishing differences in luminance, differences in brightness, in uh, monochromatic detail, much more than any color. So you may recall, I guess maybe from high school, um, going over the uh, biology of the human eye at a high level, and you may know that in your retina there are two types of cells that are able to, I guess, interpret incoming light. They are the rods and the cones. Uh, and there are more rods than cones. In general, your eye has a great deal more rods than cones, and rods are the cells that can distinguish differences in brightness, so pick up the amount of light coming in irrespective of its color. Modulo a bunch of biases that are way beyond the, the, the level of this course. So human vision in terms of colors favors green, but moreover, so independent of any color, human vision is very good at uh, distinguishing differences in brightness. And what we want is to throw some information away from our original image. Uh, and we are going to see over the course of this lecture that by transforming the image into a representation that allows us to, to pack together greens and brightness in one channel and put aside reds and blues into another means that we can quite cleverly eliminate detail in the red and blue area of the spectrum in a way that human eyes aren't as likely to notice as we might do in an RGB representation.
So the first idea before we get there is, okay, so I've managed to separate this image out into three planes. So the red, the blue, and the green. Um, and I know that my human eyes are very good at seeing green, and you don't have to take my word for that just yet. The examples I'm about to show you, I think, will prove the point pretty well. A lot of the examples in this lecture almost seem like optical illusions. It's bizarre um, how much difference we get by scaling other colors versus green. But one idea would be, okay, so my human eyes are very good at distinguishing differences in green, and certainly in this image, differences between shades of green seem to be significant. So how about this? Instead of sending my image as a bunch of RGB triples, I will separate my image out into the three color planes and manipulate them separately. In other words, what I could do is I could scale down just the red and blue channels. And so the red and blue channels, if I scale them down by a factor of one half, um, then I end up using one quarter as many pixels that I'm storing in the red and blue channels. And then I just scale them back up again when I want to recombine the image. So for compression purposes, in transit, I'll store the red and blue channels at a lower resolution, and then at their destination, the decompressor can scale them back up and then recombine the three channels into a reconstructed RGB image. Uh, so for example, if we're using this 500 by 335 image, I could store the red and blue planes as, I don't know, 125 by 84. So that would be reducing each dimension by a factor of four. So I end up storing 1 16th as many pixels. That would result, I think you'll agree, in a pretty severe reduction of resolution in red and blue. Uh, and then to view the complete image, uh, once, you know, if you were to receive the green channel in full resolution and the red and blue channels in this resolution, you scale up the red and blue channels to match the resolution of the green channel, um, and then you recombine them into one RGB image. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about scaling in this lecture, and as I mentioned in the previous lecture, the, deconstructor can, uh, the decompressor can take a lot of leeway in what it does to, in the scaling process. I'm deliberately not going to do that, so I'm going to use a very simple scaling technique. When I talk about avoiding hidden complexity, I mean in terms of what you see. I, I want you to see the artifacts produced by these scaling techniques exactly as they exist. The decompressor, of course, can try and mask them over with some kind of a blur filter, or some kind of interpolation, but if you only see that, you won't notice the characteristic artifacts. So to avoid hidden complexity in terms of our learning of this topic, we're going to use a very simple scaling procedure. So suppose I start with this image, which is 4 by 4 and I want to downscale it. If I downscale it by a factor of two, then it's pretty easy to see that each of my large pixels that I end up with, because the downscaling effectively is saying that this collection of four pixels now corresponds to this single pixel, which means really that spatially the pixel sort of gets larger. It's easy to see that um, in the large pixel I end up with, there are exactly four input pixels contained in that area. And in cases where my scale factor is not a factor of two, um, there might be some overlap, but I, I could locate all the pixels that lie inside of my larger pixels area, and I could average their values to produce my, my new pixel value. So um, that is, these four input pixels are average to produce this pixel. This might have been solid black, but in this, the average value might be a little bit brighter than solid black. Uh, and similarly, I average these four, and you can see that the average value is not bright white, like it would be in two of the four input pixels, nor is it dark, like the darkest shade of black. It's some kind of average, it's some synthesis of them. And then if I want to upscale, all I'm going to do is take this um, two by two image and just uh, turn each pixel into four pixels, and they're going to get exactly the same value. Um, I think that's the most naive and basic scaling technique. It's the one where I have as little up my sleeve as possible. Now, in, in, in reality, so, so if you're designing a lossy image compression scheme, you could have the decompressor apply a few tricks at this stage so that you don't get this blocky appearance. The issue is those tricks are sort of subjective. They are going to manipulate the appearance of the image image, and we don't want that to frustrate our ability to understand what's happening behind the scenes. So, for example, if I apply some interpolation to observe that, hey, some of the surrounding pixels are, are uh, uh, b surrounding this black pixel are a little bit brighter in color, maybe I should lighten this black pixel a little bit. That would remove the perception of there being blockiness. It wouldn't necessarily mean the result is any closer to the original input image um, than the alternative. And that's why I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave the blockiness in the result with the understanding that a decompressor might try some tricks to cover that up, but ultimately they're just cover-ups. They don't actually improve the real detail that's present. They just disguise the artifacts. Um, okay, so of course that means that our upscaled result is going to have a pixelated appearance. Our original image, of course, had 
four pixels by four pixels, although our upscaled result also is four by four, um, really it's actually these blocks of two by two pixels corresponding to the large pixels in our intermediate representation. So we should expect to see some pixelation artifacts as a result of the procedure that I'm, that I'm describing. Now in particular, the procedure I'm alluding to here is I want to scale down just one of the three color planes. So I subject only the red and blue planes to this scaling procedure. I guess I can interpret that like saying, okay, so green gets sent over exactly as it is, and red and blue get sent through this scaling procedure, and then they are both downscaled and upscaled. Um, so the decompressor receives the green channel in full resolution. And when it recombines things, so when it lays the rescaled red and blue channels on top of the unscaled green channel, there will be some pixelation, but it won't be uh, absolute because the green channel isn't subject to the same scaling procedure. Now, when you see the images, maybe you'll, you'll get what I mean. Um, so this process is called chroma subsampling, where I take apart the image into a bunch of channels, usually, well, in the case of chroma subsampling, they would be channels by color, and then I scale some of them. The word subsampling comes to us from signal processing, and this is part of the legacy of how image processing, digital image processing, where we usually think of images, especially in our context, where we're not doing an image processing course here, we think of digital images as 2D arrays of pixels, so very discrete things. Um, the word subsampling comes from the fact that a lot of image processing theory, or the background of image processing, including things like color systems, comes out of analog image processing. So that would be pho photography or videography especially. So we'll actually see later in this lecture that a lot of the techniques we want to use on digital images are derived from things that were used to effectively compress analog images or analog video, like old analog television signals. So the word subsampling is actually a more general term that means scaling. So scaling an entire image up or down is a, is a certain, can be viewed as an extension of what subsampling means. Although I think these days, if we talk about images, we usually talk about scaling an image if we're performing a, a uniform scaling operation. The term chroma subsampling is this idea of scaling only some of our color planes. So um, in this example here, on the right hand side, the image on the right is the same image as on the left, except that what I've done is subjected the red and blue planes only to scaling. Um, so they have been subjected to this procedure here. Uh, and I should also observe that notice how my scale factors refer to the dimensions. So when I scale this, this 4x4 image down by a factor of 2, or you could, it, I, I often write that as a scale factor of 1 half as well, depending on context, one is more convenient to use than the other. Notice that what I mean by that is that each, the number of pixels in each direction goes down by a factor of 2. So here there were 4 pixels uh, on the left, and now there are 2, it's now 2 pixels by 2 pixels. The, so when I use a down, a scale factor of one half or two x or whatever, I'm not scaling the total number of pixels because there are 16 pixels here and there are only four here. I'm scaling down the dimensions. Each dimension is getting scaled down. So the actual reduction in the number of pixels is actually this number squared. There are one quarter the number of original pixels. Okay, so what I've done here is I've scaled down the red and blue planes so they now contain one ninth their original number of pixels. I've reduced the resolution of red and blue by to one third of its previous value in each dimension. Um, and you can, if you look at this image at a glance, I don't think you'll notice anything wrong. There are artifacts present. I'll explore those in more detail in a minute, but I want to observe right off the bat that if I go around um, scaling down two of my three color planes, so two of the three of them, I'm removing quite a bit of information. Um, I'm actually looking at less than 50% of the amount of information I had before, the amount of data I had before. Um, I get an image that's pretty nice. I, I don't really see any obvious issues. If you scroll back to this slide later, and as usual, like in the previous lecture, you probably want to pull up the slides on the side to look at them. Don't necessarily zoom in on the YouTube video and assume you'll see all the same detail that I can see. So maybe pull up the slides over on the side. If you come back to this slide later and you zoom in on certain critical areas, and we'll, we'll see in this lecture this area here, and in general the boundaries around the bright background are places where we're likely to see artifacts, you will see artifacts, but they're not obvious at a glance. And we know from, from last time that the gold standard for artifacts is lossy compression will introduce artifacts if we throw information away. But if our viewer doesn't see them, we don't care that they're there. 
Okay, so here's the original image, and here's the result after subsampling, scaling down just the red and blue planes um, to one third their original resolution in each dimension. And as I said, if you zoom in on this, you will notice something strange is happening there. A certain sort of quasi pixelation effect, maybe a sawtooth pattern that overlaps the relatively sharply defined boundary of the pair. Um, now, if I were to scale down just the green channels, let's contrast this image, which is the result of me scaling down the red and blue channels. So to be sure, I have eliminated a lot of information from this image. Let's contrast this with just scaling the green channel and leaving red and blue as they are. So in this image, I have lost way less data than I did in the previous one. I, I am keeping a lot more information. This requires a lot more space than the previous image. But if we flip back and forth, I think you'll agree that the one where I scale red and blue looks way better than the one where I scale green, even though I'm throwing away twice as much information in this image as I am in this one. In particular, notice that on the face of the pair, you get what look like old, just old-fashioned pixelation. So nothing specific. There are funny artifacts appearing in the one where I've scaled down red and blue, but they're not as easy to pin down. In the previous lecture we saw, if we just scale the whole image down, we get an effect that isn't too different from this, this pixelated effect, which we can see pretty much everywhere in this image. Um, we can see it in the, between the background and the leaves. We can see it around the various boundaries of the pear, on the other boundaries of leaves. Whereas if I look at the one where I scale down red and blue, it looks pretty good. Artifacts are present, but they're not that obvious. At a glance, I think I would look at this image Image and say this image looks like it's at a low resolution. This image looks generally pixelated. And I think that right there is enough to begin proving my point. Um, if you didn't believe that human vision was good at seeing green before this series of examples, I think you might start to believe it now. But you could still be skeptical. You could say, but wait a minute, of course reducing the green resolution of this particular image is going to result in a nasty appearance because the image is full of green. So maybe it's just that this image is biased towards needing that green detail. Fair enough. I hear you. Let's try this image. So I've got this nice delicious fruit salad here. This fruit Fruit salad does contain some greens. That looks very nice, nice kiwi. I'm recording this at about 10 o'clock in the morning, so I immediately I, I sort of want to go get some brunch looking at this. Um, I've got some kiwi there. I've got some blueberries. I don't have any very highly saturated blues in this image, but there are blues appearing. I also do have quite a, a range of red values. And for later reference, uh, I should add, I view this these pomegranate arrows um, to be the most intense reds in this image. And we'll notice later that that, does, that is significant. When we, don't, when we lose red resolution, it'll be, I think, most obvious in the pomegranate arrows. So there's the original image. Let's try scaling down just the red and blue color planes. Okay, there it is. So there's the original. There's with that, when I scale down red and blue. And I believe that if you look at this, you can spot artifacts. So if you zoom in a little bit, you will probably see a small amount of pixelation forming on this boundary here. This is the boundary between a bluish region and a reddish region. So there's no green to help us out with this boundary. So it shouldn't surprise us that if I scale down red and blue, I'll notice uh, the effect more there than I would, let's say, in a green region. Um, and if I go looking elsewhere, I can actually see other forms of pixelation. It's easy to flip back and forth and see it, but I'll notice pixelation maybe here. Um, I see a little bit of pixelation forming around this, these pomegranate arrows. And as I said earlier, they are going to be probably the most noticeable form of artifacts when I lose red detail. Okay, so sure enough, if I scale down um, just uh, red and blue, I, I will get some detail loss. Let's compare scaling down red and blue. I actually did this, did this by accident. I already revealed this. Let's try um, comparing the scaled red and blue version with just scaling green. Okay, so here it is just scaling green. Here I am scaling red and blue. And I would argue that even in regions that are heavy on reds, scaling down green results in pixelation. And I think maybe a minute ago I jumped ahead and looked at this image too early, but the pixelation I see in the pomegranate arrows is actually more pixelated in the version where I scale down green than it is in the version where I scale down red and blue, which is weird because you'd think I need more red detail here. And the issue is maybe more red detail is objectively better, but my human eyes aren't as good at seeing it. I'll see a reduction in green detail a lot more noticeably than I'll see a reduction in red and blue. So I can throw away a lot more information um, if I throw it away carefully, if I choose what to throw away based on the biases of my visual system. If I begin throwing away green, let's take a tour. I get pixelation in the pomegranate arrows. I get some pixelation forming in this piece of, I guess that's pineapple there. Um, I get pixelation on the edge of this piece of 
pineapple, and I get a very noticeable pixelation on the green kiwi. That shouldn't surprise me too much because of course it's green and I've scaled down the green channel. Just to make some, just to, to uh, put things in context, if I scale down both red and blue by a factor of one third, so each of red and blue is now being stored as an image that is um, one third of its original size. In other words, uh, I'm now using one ninth as many pixels. Scaling down red and blue to one third their original resolution produces an image of basically this size. If I do that, then the total size of the image is 40% um, of the original size. So I've scaled down the red and blue planes so so that I'm using one ninth as many pixels as I was earlier. And so therefore it's gonna be one third plus, um, I guess that's two over 27. Uh, so that's 40% of the original size. If I reduce two of the color planes. If I reduce two of the color planes by a factor of five in both dimensions, it comes out to be 0 0.36, so 36% its original size. Maybe you're noticing we're gonna get a bit of a law of diminishing returns here. So just let's let's take a look at that. Um, here I have scaled down um, the original image, which I don't have uh, handy, but I mean we know what it looks like. There's the original image. Uh, I scaled down the original image such that the red and blue planes are now uh, been scaled by a factor of five in both dimensions to one fifth of their previous dimensions. So the pixels you could think of the size of the pixels in the red and blue planes are five times larger than the size of the pixels spatially in the original image. And if I go and stare at the boundary of the pair there or maybe here or here or this boundary, diagonal boundaries will make this more obvious, but also you see something very odd happening on one of these thin stems. Uh, you'll notice if I look, we'll start with this boundary, that there is this odd sawtooth pattern forming along the boundary of the pair. But unlike a fully pixelated image like we saw in the last lecture, we do still have a very obvious boundary of the pair. It is still very crisply defined, but there's this weird sawtooth overlap as these two color planes don't quite match up in resolution because the pixels in the red and blue color planes are now much larger than the pixels in the green color plane. You'll also notice that the, the artifacts we see, the weird pixelated like artifacts, are brightly colored. They're bright purple or they're bright green. Uh, and that's because, of course, these are artifacts showing up in, in a particular part of the color space, so in the red or in the blue plane. But by not scaling the green plane, by keeping one of my color planes at full resolution, especially if it's the green one, I am able to maintain um, the illusion of a lot of detail. I don't get a fully pixelated appearance because one of the color planes is pulling all of the weight. It's able to provide me with fine-grained distinctions between regions. Now let's look at this stem here. If you pull up the slide and zoom in on the stem here, um, you will notice that although I still see the stem well-defined, like I, I haven't lost resolution for the stem, which is so thin that it's actually probably thinner than the size of one pixel in the scaled down red and blue planes. Although I still see the stem, it is subject to very strange artifacting. In particular, if you zoom in on this region, you'll notice there are these, these two, this sort of rectangular greenish region, which is the result of a mismatch between the color planes. A decompressor could do a little bit to cut Cover that up. A certain um, tasteful blur filter might help to eliminate that. And um, processing techniques, so, so schemes like JPEG that use subsampling among many other things that result in blocky artifacts, will often have in their decompressor deblocking filters. They'll have various filters that are meant to cover up, to smear over some of the artifacts produced by um, by the various transformations used to achieve compression. We're not gonna do that because we, we, we actually want to look directly at these artifacts. Um, I also will observe there is some sense of global pixelation happening in some parts. So if I zoom in on this, it does look a little bit pixelated when I zoom in on it. It's not that noticeable, although that's not because of cleverness, it's because it just happens to be a blurry area of the image. I also see a certain form of pixelation cropping up sort of back there, if you wanna zoom in. Um, and although I still get the full definition of the leaf, I can see the impact of pixelation happening with the overlap of those red and blue color planes between the background and the uh, foreground. Um, okay, so then here's the fruit salad. If I reduce this with the red and blue planes reduced by a factor of one over five, I do begin to notice visible pixelation. So in those pomegranate arrows, so here, um, where which of course are very intensely red and therefore rely quite a bit on having some detail in the red plane, I am now noticing a detail loss. Um, if you zoom in on that, you'll see pixelation. You don't have to zoom very far to see the pixelation. Um, I also notice the characteristic um, sawtooth artifacts uh, there um, on the edge of this piece of pineapple. And the reason the artifacts tend to show up more um, on the boundary between a light region and a dark region, so notice how the, the, 
the foreground pineapple is very brightly colored and what's behind it's sort of dark. Similarly, um, back here we had these artifacts showing up between the pear, which is sort of medium intensity, and the background, which is very bright. The reason is because um, in your original image, if you have a sharply defined boundary between light and dark, and you try and scale down one of the color planes, that means one pixel in the scaled down color plane crosses over between the light region and the dark region. So when I assign a value to this pixel, it's going to have to have either a bright value or a dark value, and that's going to stick out a bit against the other, against the alternative. So if this is my dark region and my pixel ends up with a bright value, well then there'll be a little bit of a bright intrusion into my dark region in the rescaled image. Similarly, if I choose to give the scaled pixel a dark value, then there will be this dark region poking into the bright region in my rescaled image. That's why these artifacts, the sawtooth pattern is more noticeable on the boundary between bright and dark. So I, I have that. I also notice pixelation in areas that are heavy on reds and blues and on boundaries between red and blue because they depend on the red and blue color planes to give them their detail and I've scaled those down. Um, I see some sawtooth artifacts here. Um, where else? I see something happening there, often between these brighter yellow regions and background areas. There is a pixelation artifact occurring between the background and these sort of darker things close to the background, but it's not as noticeable at first because the, the stuff back here isn't the human, I, I guess my visual system doesn't focus much on, on this area of the image at first because I want to focus on the foreground. Okay, so that's what happens if I scale red and blue by a factor of one over five. Um, now, uh, I should observe that we can save quite a bit of space at first by doing this. So notice that if I scale every uh, red and blue by a factor of one-fifth, then I get down to 36% of my original size, which is pretty good because remember that a typical lossless scheme couldn't usually get us above uh, below 50%. And I've already gotten below 50% by just using one technique. And I could then feed this into a lossless technique to save a bit more space. Um, however, maybe observe that if I keep one of my color planes at the original resolution, that means it'll be one plus something plus something over three. Even if I deleted these other two color planes, the size would still be at least one over three. So I get a law of diminishing returns. No matter how much more I scale down the red and blue color planes, I'm not going to get below 33% of my original size. Um, and keeping the green layer at full resolution means I don't get that general quality loss that I would get if I scaled the whole image down. If I were to decide to scale the green layer down, what I'm doing is basically a combination of chroma subsampling and a global image scaling operation, which I talked about in the last lecture, which I said wasn't really a good technique to use. The person who's providing the image, the user of your compression scheme, presumably wants the image to be at that resolution. If they've chosen a certain resolution, they probably want that resolution to be maintained. So you want to do anything you can to maintain detail at that level of resolution. So keeping one color plane at the same resolution is going to be sort of an invariant for this lecture. We're going to keep at least one color plane at its original resolution, because if we scaled every color plane down, we're just doing a global image scaling operation followed by further subsampling. Um, okay, so at, after a certain point, the slides are a bit late to the party here, but as we've noticed, if, if I keep scaling down, subsampling will produce noticeable blocky artifacts. The advantage of this style of artifact versus the ones we saw, the general pixelation, is that he, a, a viewer that is unfamiliar with scaling techniques, unfamiliar with subsampling, although they notice something is wrong, it doesn't have as jarring an effect as global pixelation, as the uh, uniform scaling artifacts that we saw last time. Because a human observer is thinking that we've subsampled a particular color plane. They do notice pixelation, they notice the blocky artifacts, but they, they don't have the same perception of quality loss because unlike pixelation, unlike global pixelation, the green channel gives us enough detail to retain the sharp boundaries between regions of the image, although there's a little bit of overlap uh, of those blocky artifacts. Um, if I scale it excessively, so if I scale red and blue down to one-tenth of their original resolution, the artifacts are very obvious. So somebody looking at this would notice these pretty quickly. Um, and you can see, again, um, in the red and blue planes, the pixels are now um, ten times bigger in a spatial sense than they were originally. By scaling the image down to have ten times less resolution um, in each dimension, we're basically making the pixels ten times bigger than they were originally. And as a result, those large pixels, I can actually outline some of them. They're so big. Um, and because they overlap regions of the image, they might overlap the, the bright background and the less bright pair, we see that sawtooth effect. Um, and I also observe that at this point, Although the boundary of the pair is still pretty crisp, it isn't as obvious. 
those those large pixels, um, the large blocky artifacts are obscuring the boundaries. Here, for example, on the right hand side, the boundary of the pair is clear. Like if you look carefully, you will see the boundary of the pair is well defined, but at a glance, it looks like something strange is happening because of the amount of overlap, um, the, the amount of pixelation uh, effect produced by those blocky artifacts. I can also see something pretty nasty happening at every area near this background, and actually near both of the background areas that are bright, we see a pretty nasty pixelation effect happening. A decompressor could do a little bit to help us with this, but probably not that much. Um, that is, the best it could do is smear it over a little bit in a way that would make it a little bit less noticeable, but not restore any of the detail of the image. Um, now, okay, again, this is on the green image, so what happens if our image is not primarily green? Um, so if the image is not primarily green, then the artifacts are, of course, going to be more noticeable in non-green places. So in the, in the, when we scaled it down to uh, one-fifth of its previous resolution, we noticed that there was pixelation already visible here and in this area, which is primarily red and blue. If I scale it down to one-tenth of its original resolution, um, then uh, we can see very visible pixelation in lots of places. At this point, at one-tenth, if I scale red and blue to one-tenth of their original resolution, um, do I actually have a larger version of this? No, I don't. Okay, so um, then I end up with the pomegranate arrows being almost unrecognizable. They're visibly fully pixelated. I, I, I mean, I can guess what they are, but if I didn't already, if I hadn't already seen this picture, I might not know. Um, although it's clear these are blueberries, I guess, to people that know what blueberries look like, this whole region's a mess if I scale down red and blue to one tenth of their original resolution, because I, I can't, even green can't help me. I get this odd ghostly illusion of detail showing up in some parts of it, but I don't get enough detail to know what's going on. On the other hand, the kiwi is still, you know, pretty easy to distinguish because it's green and I'm leaving green at full resolution. Um, this pineapple has some internal pixelation and there is this very noticeable bright purple and bright green sawtooth artifact forming on the boundary. I also see the sawtooth artifacts up here and I see a little bit of them down here and over here and over here and over here. And of course, this is because I've driven the method too far. If I scale down by 1 over 10, I I'm, I'm going to see a pretty noticeable loss in quality. The key is to be tasteful. If we scale each plane down by one half or one third, you might not notice it at all. And that's why schemes like JPEG will often do that. They will not scale the, the, the planes by one tenth, but they will scale them by one half. It's an easy way of saving a bunch of bandwidth. Now, one observation to make is that, uh, that the slides have been making all along and I haven't been talking about, um, is that um, the RGB color system is pretty heavy. It, it depends heavily on colors. So obviously we've got a plane for red, a plane for green, and a plane for blue. I said earlier that of course human vision is biased towards green, but human vision is much more biased towards luminance, towards essentially for our purposes brightness. And yet RGB doesn't store brightness separately. The brightness information about the image is sort of spread out among red, green, and blue planes. And that's a problem. Because that means if I scale down the red and blue planes, although I might lose red detail or blue detail, which I could argue aren't that important, I also lose luminance detail because the luminance information is diffused among all three planes. And that's a problem. That means if I subsample, that can noticeably affect the luminance information in the image and it can, it can produce weird issues with brightness between areas of the image. And actually part of that sawtooth artifact is the result of that. Notice how um, behind this piece of pineapple, I'm gonna draw, I'll trace the boundary of the piece of pineapple. Behind the piece of pineapple, so outside of that boundary, is a dark region. But the artifacts artificially brighten. You'll notice the areas of the artifacts that overlap the dark region are very bright. That's because um, some of the luminance information of the image is stored in the red and blue planes. And when I aggregate those planes down to a small resolution, I, I lose some of the detail in brightness. And my eyes are looking for brightness, and my eyes are looking for green. Although it's easy in RGB to get rid of the non-green detail, it's not so easy to get rid of the, um, the red and blue detail without losing some brightness detail detail, and that's something I might notice. So really what I'm coming to here is that the RGB color system isn't really the best choice for subsampling. We can get some mileage out of it, but we, we lose traction pretty quickly as we scale things down. Okay, so here's some more examples in fine detail. So here we are with the pair, or the original pair. There it is if I scale down red and blue by one over 10. And I would say this is clearly a bit of a mess, but the original image is there. I can look at this and say, this is still a picture of a pear hanging in a tree with some grass behind it. It looks really ugly. Uh, I can see the artifacts, but I can get a lot of the salient detail. 
On the other hand, if I keep red and blue at their original resolution, keeping in mind this image requires a great deal more space than the one before it. So I've actually allowed myself to use more space, but I've scaled down the green channel and it looks like garbage. Um, it looks like I have maybe, I, I've created some weird like 8-bit rendering or something like that. I, I have deliberately pixelated it under the most charitable interpretation. If you stare at it carefully, you'll notice that some of the detail I'm preserving in the red and blue planes, you can and distinguish it. You can see the boundary of the pair. It's just hiding underneath all of the loss in green detail. And my eyes want the green so badly that I don't care whether there's still some detail like the stems and stuff are still present in the background as sort of ghost images. I don't care. The image looks like a huge mess. And as usual, like I said previously in the lecture, maybe that's just because the image relies too heavily on green. So we'll try a comparison. Here's the original fruit salad. Here's the fruit salad scaled down with red and blue at one-tenth of their original definition. And we can see the pomegranate arrows are completely, um, it's hard to know what they are at this point. There's one over there. The yellow areas suffer. I get the sawtooth artifacts in a lot of places. Um, the kiwi looks great, of course, because it's, it's in the green, it's primarily in the green channel. It lives in the green channel. Um, although some of the brightness information for the kiwi lives in the red and blue channels. Uh, and you can see evidence of that because if you zoom in on some corners of the kiwi, you'll notice a peculiar pixelation adjacent artifact. Um, this middle region, the piece of, I guess, melon and the blueberry looks like a huge mess. Okay, fair enough. We, we um, drove the method too far. We scaled red and blue down too much. But let's contrast that in this not particularly um, green focused image. Let's contrast scaling red and blue down by a factor of 10 with scaling green. Here I've scaled green down by a factor of 10. And I would argue, and I hope you would agree with me, that even though parts of the image are red or blue, those parts still suffer significantly from this change. If I scale down red and blue, yes, I get a bunch of pixelation. Yes, it's not great. If I scale down just green, keeping in mind this requires more space than the previous image, I have done less compression, I end up with something that's, a, that's pretty much a huge mess. Even in red and green, uh, red and blue heavy areas of the image, like this area, here or the pomegranate arrows, I still see a, a pretty significant degradation in quality. It's neat though to compare the degradation to this region in this version where I scale green versus this version where I scale red and blue. When I scale red and blue I get pixelation. When I scale green I get an effect that is hard to pin down. It's not quite pixelation. I actually have a surprising amount of red detail in these pomegranate arrows, but they still look unnatural. They look sort of haunted or something. Um, I do see some other pixelation. This pixelation is not just the result of the green channel being artificially aggregated downwards. It's also because, notice how the pixelation stands out because of its brightness. That's because some of the luminance information is in the green channel, and that means when it gets scaled, the luminance information gets screwed up. That's also what's happening with some of these weird speckly artifacts here. That's the result of brightness being scaled down, and our eyes, of course, are drawn to brightness. Um, the slices of kiwi, unsurprisingly, look like garbage because they're in the green channel and I've just scaled the green channel down. But other parts of the image that are red heavy look terrible. Um, these blueberries, which are, you know, blue, look sort of awful as well. This slice of pineapple, which is, well, so pineapple is yellow um, and yellow in the RGB system is a combination of red and green, strangely. So it makes sense the pineapple loses resolution and the other piece of pineapple does too. But I think hopefully this is enough to prove my point that even though your image has reds and blues in it, scaling the green channel can still hurt the image a lot more globally than scaling the red and blue channels because of our human perceptual bias in favor of green. Okay, so what do we do? Um, well, my suggestion is use a different color system. I have decided to represent my image in RGB. But why? Why do I do that? Now, there are lots of reasons for that. There's an interesting history behind that. So it goes, down, it goes back to theories of um, the way that the human eye works that date back to the 18, 18 or the mid uh, 19th century, so the 1850s or so, um, and the fact that computer displays are, are have often been designed. So in the era of CRT displays through to modern LCD and LED displays, they've been designed for R, G, and B to be the primary colors. There's no reason though that R, G, and B are the best choice for primary colors, and there's certainly no reason why we have to encode our images using a primary color blending system um, as our color representation. We could, for example, choose a different set of 
coordinates, we could perform a coordinate transformation to a different color system that isn't RGB. Now, I could give a long lecture about color systems, but, but I said earlier, we're taking a breather, we're not going to do that. So for once, I'm going to cut to the chase. I want to use a color system called YCBCR, and it has three channels, Y, CB, and CR. The trick is these channels have been, um, have been designed such that a lot of the information that we consider important in compression is stored in one channel, the Y channel. And other information that we consider less important, so such as the impact of blue or red, is stored in these two other channels, CB and CR. If you stare at CB and CR a bit as grayscale, you'll notice that they don't seem to actually be the blue and red color channels. They're almost negative images, and we'll see why that is in a few minutes. It's because the computation to go back and forth from RGB to YCBCR basically phrases CB and CR as differentials between Y and the true blue or red color channels. And and also that there is no channel for green because it turns out most of the green information has been packed into the Y channel in a certain abstract sense, I guess, which is nice because the Y channel is, both a, is a combination of both luminance, brightness information, which we know is a big deal, and it contains a lot of the detail we need for green, which is good because those are the two things we want to preserve the most. Um, a note on naming. So I'm going to call this color system YCBCR. This is the color system used uh, in the JPEG scheme, which we're using as our point of reference for, for lossy image compression. Um, you will, however, often, if you read about this, you'll often hear, um, you'll hear about this color system, YUV. And you might also hear about this one, although I don't know why you would for this context, YIQ. These are called, and you might even hear about this, YPBPR. And these are other valid color systems that um, are derived from analog video and analog image representations, or generally, though, analog video. So the YUV, YIQ, and YPBPR representations are the way that colors are represented in analog video. Um, and uh, YCBCR has a lot in common with YUV, but YUV is an analog system. Uh, as a result, though, a lot of people that talk about YCBCR will just talk about YUV. They, they, they'll, use, they'll actually be using YCBCR, but they'll call it YUV. Um, contrast how the deflate standard kept saying Huffman coding, even though it was using pre prefix coding, or contrast the fact that some people say LZ77 instead of LZSS. I think it's, it's the same sort of deal. So I'm not going to say YUV. If you see YUV ever mentioned in the context of digital images, likely they're talking about YCBCR because YUV would typically be reserved for analog images or for digital representations that are meant to very closely approximate the way analog images are stored. These other two systems, so YIQ um, is a specific way that uh, signals are encoded for transmission in old analog video. YPBPR is a system that uses is a similar breakdown of colors, but an analog system that was used for component analog video. Okay, so that's all over with. We're going to say YCBCR for this system. Um, so YCBCR is a descendant, or it's related to those other systems from a minute ago, like YUV, um, which were designed. So YUV was, and related systems like YIQ, I'm, I'm going to deliberately conflate them because this is not a course on analog video. Um, systems like that were originally brought into use when television went from black and white to color. So as you know, at the dawn of television technology, uh, television sets were black and white. They, they were able to display moving grayscale images. And the way that television signals work is very weird and obscure. Like it, it requires a lot of strange techniques that we, in 2023, are finally rid of in digital video, although early digital video tried to reproduce some of the peculiar techniques used in analog television transmission, like frame interlacing, that made a real mess out of video. I'll talk about that. I'll allude to that a bit in a couple of lectures. Anyway, when television was invented, television sets were black and white. Okay. Um, later on, color television was invented. The problem with color television wasn't just finding a way of displaying color images, it was a backwards compatibility problem. It was the fact that in the 1960s, so I'll talk about North America first here, I'm not, I, I know more about the history of television in North America because that's where I grew up, uh, although I was born significantly later than the 1960s, so some of this is reading that I've done. Um, in the 1960s, as color television was widely adopted, there was this problem of 
of a television network or television station would want to be able to transmit an image that people could still watch on their black and white TVs. And this was also, from a regulatory standpoint, sort of a big deal. We didn't want to suddenly switch over to color TV signals and, and then that day everybody had to go out and buy a color TV. Not everybody can afford to buy a new television. What they wanted was a color television system that would still be compatible with black and white display. In other words, what they wanted was a way of transmitting color TV signals such that maybe um, an old-fashioned TV could still display some part of the signal without any change in its interpretation as a black and white image. To do this, they designed a color system where one of the three color channels was just the grayscale version of the image, or I guess an ideal grayscale version of the image. So if all you could do was interpret this, you could still display a grayscale image. They then developed a couple of, a couple of clever encoding techniques or transmission techniques such that an old-fashioned black and white TV could just be sent this signal. And the other two channels were also sent in a different way. So it, they were sent uh, in a way that the black and white TV wouldn't notice that they were there, but a color TV could still pick them up. Um, therefore, uh, you could send the same signal that could be received by both black and white and color TVs. The black and white TV would just get this one and display a very nice black and white image. The color TV would get all three of them and recombine them to get the color image. Now, the difference then versus now is that these would be sent as not, well, okay, this is still Y, but this would be U and V, or it would be sent as Y, I, and then Q. So there's the other two systems, Y, U, V, and Y, I, Q, that were used to send um, color TV signals. And the idea was the Y channel uh, encapsulates uh, the luminance information, and it does turn out it's secretly hiding a bunch of the green information too. The Y channel is meant to be the idealized grayscale version of the image. And the reason they did that back then was that it meant it was very easy for black and white TVs to still display these images and make available enough information to reconstruct a color image. But it's also good for another reason, which is that, hey, while you're transmitting these extra color channels, you don't need to transmit them at the same resolution as the luminance channel. You could do exactly what we're talking about today, subsampling. And that was often done, as we'll come back to later. And uh, with the development of digital video later, when we came up with the actual YCBCR scheme, which is the more discrete digital version of YUV or, or of the YUV scheme, not really related to YIQ. Um, the same thing was done. The Y channel contains all of the important stuff. If I want to save bandwidth, I can just cut down the CB and CR channels, let's say to half of their original resolution, and maybe nobody would notice. And the way we know this is because this is actually done. If you watch TV, if you actually watch digital video, odds are that's happened. Most digital video that you see, oh, oh I, when I say most, that's, that's an understatement. The vast majority of digital video that you watch, digital photorealistic video, so filmed by a camera, filming people with a camera, um, has been subjected to that kind of subsampling. One of the color planes is stored at full resolution. The other two color planes are stored at probably one half resolution. And because all this time you have been watching TV and digital video and haven't noticed the difference, I would argue that subsampling is a pretty clever loss, lossy compression technique. The trick is finding a color system that lets you eliminate information. And YCBCR is a great example of such a system. So the idea is human visual perception is biased very heavily towards luminance, towards uh, brightness, um, and movement. But of course, movement isn't our, a big deal for us when we're just talking about still images. For video, of course, that's going to be a big deal. Our eyes have evolved for a lot of different reasons to be able to notice moving things very, very um, easily. So we're very good at noticing movement, and we're very good at distinguishing differences in brightness. We may not be that good at distinguishing shades of blue versus shades of green, but we need to know our priorities because then we know what, inf what information we can easily sacrifice. Um, so if I store my images in a format that puts all of the luminance information in one layer and all the color information in two other layers, it's really easy to go and throw away information from the color layers um, because I retain all that brightness information and that's what I'm looking for. If I notice a loss in quality, it's, it, I'll notice it much more quickly if I lose the brightness luminance information than if I lose color information. Um, so it turns out YCBCR is, can be obtained via a linear function of the RGB representation. There are lots of other color systems I could try using. So other color systems that you might use in photo editing or image editing are HSV and HSL. Um, this would stand for hue, saturation, and value, or in the L case, level. And broadly speaking, in these two systems, H and S 
represent color, and V and L represent more or less luminance or brightness, and that's actually um, uh, deliberate. But it's also true that HSV and HSL can't easily be con can't easily be uh, constructed uh, from RGB values without a nonlinear transformation. So you actually need to uh, evaluate trigonometric functions to to determine H and S if you want to convert to HSV or HSL from RGB. That's annoying. That requires computation, and it can introduce more errors into your calculation because you need to use these mathematical functions that have to be very accurate. Um, YCBCR is nice because you can obtain the YCBCR component components of a pixel uh, via a linear function. I want to call it a linear transformation, but somebody on the internet might get mad at me. It is a linear function with representation we are going to use. Um, in this example, y, if I have the RGB coordinates of a pixel, y is this linear combination of R, G, and B. I hope that you, like me, will look at that for the first time and say, wait a minute, that seems like a, a bunch of magic numbers. Like, these numbers don't seem to... Why are they written as just decimal expansions? Are they fractions? Do they mean anything? And the answer is, well, yes, they're meaningful, but they're not meaningful in that nice, crunchy, mathematical way that we want, where we want it to be some universal constant that we derive from the, from the basic constraints of the universe or something. No, this is the result of, uh, among other things, empirical evaluation, because the human eye has evolved um, in a way that doesn't necessarily correspond to mathematical constants of the universe. Um, now, uh, as I said a minute ago, the ideal way that we can break our color system up to preserve detail is to have one of my three planes be a, a, the grayscale, the ideal grayscale representation of the image. And actually, I, I was that was not entirely true. Y, the Y channel, isn't the true ideal grayscale representation, ideal in an objective universal sense. Um, that is, if I want to convert an image to grayscale, there is actually a lot of debate over the best way of doing this. If I wanted to convert to, to determine the best black and white image I could come up with out of this source, there are lots of ways of doing it. So I could desaturate the image, I could convert the image to the HSL representation and just set saturation to zero, thereby eliminating all of the color component. That's one way of doing it. Um, I could also average the value of each pixel in the RGB representation, so I could average out, I could compute the grayscale representation with, of each pixel to be just R plus G plus B divided by three. That would turn the image into grayscale, but the image would have different dynamics as a result. Um, neither of those are actually considered to be the best grayscale representation in all cases, uh, and in general there's a lot of debate about how to do it because it depends on what the image is for. A human looking at an image will perceive it differently depending on how you convert it to grayscale, and if I want to talk about the ideal grayscale representation, don't I just care about what the human sees? Certainly for image compression that is the case. So um, to put that controversy to bed, and because we're not doing an image processing course, despite the fact that I seem to keep wanting to go in that direction with this lecture, um, I will just say that YCBCR uh, has been designed, the interpretation of YCBCR that we're going to use has been designed such that the Y channel is computed to be the ideal perceived grayscale image. So based on studies people have done about how humans see grayscale images and what grayscale representation is closest to the color representation, the set of coefficients we are using for Y computes a perceived ideal grayscale image. So in some studies, Studies, humans have decided that this computation for Y produces the most faithful grayscale rep uh, reproduction of the image possible versus other systems. But in general, there are lots of ways of making grayscale images, and which way you choose depends on what exactly you are trying to achieve. Um, now, the other ones, the weightings of colors, so actually I'll, I'll just skip to the, the formula and then I can talk my way backwards from that. Um, so here are the formulas we use to compute Y, C, B, and C, R. Earlier, I couldn't call this thing formally a linear transformation because it's an affine transformation because I add a constant to things. If I didn't add that constant, it would be uh, matrix multiplication. So it would actually be a linear transformation. Um, so the formulas we are going to use are these three to con convert from RGB to YCBCR. This is the same formula used by JPEG. That's why we're going to use it because I am not enough of an expert in color theory or whatever I need to decide what the best formula is. So I will defer to JPEG, which is so time-tested and ubiquitous that I think we can trust it. 
Um, and the people that designed, so JPEG was designed by a huge consortium of experts, including people that would know what they were talking about when they decided upon these formulas. There are lots of different um, competing formulas for computing YCBCR representations. In a sense, they're all equally as good, they're just for different applications. So there's no reason why this is the best way of converting to YCBCR, but it's the way we are going to use. Some variants of the formula um, compute CB and CR without this offset. So they just, they, they don't offset it. Um, Notice how if I get rid of these uh, offsets here, then because of the negative coefficients in some cases, CB and CR could end up being negative values. That's a bit annoying if you're doing image compression because you sort of like having only positive numbers. Then you could store CB and CR in unsigned integers or something once you truncate them. Um, for that purpose, JPEG adds this offset. So CB and CR will normally be between negative 128 and 128 without the offset. If I therefore add 128 to it, uh, I can expect that it'll be a positive value. So basically that's what's going on there. Um, the formulas are designed so that when you're done, you get positive numbers across the board. Um, so it's just a shift for convenience. JPEG does it, and I think we ought to do it too, because we have the same set of goals as JPEG. Um, I should again observe that Y, the formula for Y has been chosen to produce the ideal perceived grayscale representation. The mathematically ideal grayscale representation might be, depending on who you ask, something like the result of desaturating the image, so setting the saturation of each color value to zero. However, because we care about what humans think, often um, uh, image processing tools will just compute Y uh, of the YCBCR representation as the grayscale representation instead of doing desaturating. So that's, that's a thing you can learn about in some other course. I seem to be desperate to teach you that thing in this course, but I have to stop myself. We'll just move forward. Um, if I want to do the reverse transformation, so if this is my forward transformation to go from RGB to YCBCR, this is my inverse transformation. So if you give me YCBCR, notice how R is Y plus some function of CR. Now the minus 128, all that, all this really means is undoing that shift that I did earlier. So that really doesn't contribute anything to the color scheme. It's a way of undoing a shift that I did for convenience, as I explained a minute ago. So uh, the red channel is Y with um, some contribution from CR, a pretty heavy contribution. So the CR channel is an offset from Y um, of the, uh, that tells you the red information in the pixel. Um, remember that the value of CR uh, could be negative, especially, well, the value of CR minus 128 could be a negative number. So R could end up, um, the value of a single pixel's R could be Y minus something if this number comes out to be negative. Something similar holds for B. Notice the different coefficients because of the different weightings that I gave to R, G, and B when I computed Y. So because human vision is more, um, uh, is able to perceive green more, it may makes sense when I go to compute the ideal grayscale representation of an image, I give green a higher weight than red and blue. Red is perceived a significantly less than green, but still more than blue. So red gets a lower coefficient than green, but a higher coefficient than blue. Um, and so it makes sense that in the reverse transformation, the weighting I have to use to recover blue and red is going to be different. Notice also that I do, green is, uh, the computation for green does involve CB and CR, but notice that although um, CR is brought into the red channel with a multiplier of 1.4, and, and blue is brought in with a multiplier of 1.7, the contribution of CB and CR to the green channel is relatively minor. So 0.3 for blue, which is relatively little, 0.7 for R, which is also relatively little. And consider that if you were to combine these two coefficients, it comes out to about 1.0, or a little bit over, maybe 1.06 or something like that, um, which is significantly less than the, co the overall coefficient on that we're using to recover R and B. And that's a sign, I think, that the Y channel does actually contain a lot more green information um, than it does red or blue, which is obvious because, again, we use a larger multiplier. What this is telling me, though, is if I were to scale down CR and CB, that would, of course, eliminate a lot of my red and blue information, but it wouldn't eliminate that much of my green information. It would take away some of it, but not nearly as much as it would take away R and B. And that's exactly where we want to be. I want to have one channel with my luminance, that's Y, and as much of the green as possible. So again, Y has that. When I scale down CR and CB, I'm going to lose a bit of green, but I'll lose more red and blue, which is good good because that follows the set of biases in which, that I'm working with. So the human bias towards brightness and the human bias towards green. All right, let's talk about the subsampling. 
So um, let's see, we've got the Y channel uh, in YCBCR, which contains um, the uh, luminance and a decent amount of green. So this slide is lying a little bit when it says that it contains um, the green channel, uh, but it does contain quite a bit of the green channel. I'm going to act on that, uh, on that assumption from now on, that really green is hiding to a large extent inside of Y. Um, so here I have my subsampled RGB version from before where I've scaled down red and blue by a factor of five. I can see visible artifacts even without zooming in. Um, and uh, the CB and CR channels in YCBCR, of course, contain to a large extent the red and blue information. Let's try scaling down with YCBCR. Okay, so here is RGB. Uh, so what I've done, obviously, is I've, I've downscaled red and blue, I've then upscaled them again, and I've put them back together into a single image. And we can see the visible artifacts. Here's YCBCR, same process. I've taken Y, left it as is, or I've converted the image to YCBCR, left Y as is, scaled down CBCR, then scaled them back up again, then put the image back together and converted it back to RGB. So what you're seeing is the result of reconstructing an RGB image. However, the down scale, so the size of the downscaled version is the same as the size of this image. And if I flip back and forth, I think you'll see there are noticeable improvements in quality. Although I'm using the same amount of space, if I use YCBCR, I don't end up with as ugly a set of artifacts. There are still artifacts. So if I look, in this case, the artifacts are showing up down here. Because by deleting some of CB and CR, I am removing some of my green detail. So areas that previously were intact, because I wasn't scaling down green, now have noticeable artifacts. But I would argue that those artifacts are way less noticeable and less unpleasant looking than the artifacts I got in the RGB case. So the idea of using YCBCR is sort of working here. I am able to preserve more detail because I'm preserving especially luminance detail. One of the reasons these artifacts are so ugly is the strange brightness problem I get with that sawtooth pattern where the brightness intrudes on a less bright area of the image. Because CB and CR don't have brightness information, I don't have to worry about that with YCBCR. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, just like I, I mentioned before, just to confirm this, um, I'm starting from a full resolution source image. I convert that image into YCBCR or whatever color system I want. I downscale some of the color planes. The decompressor then reverses the process. It upscales the color planes, recombines the data into whatever system I was using, like YCBCR, and then converts the result back into RGB. Um, now, historically, the subsampling would actually occur during image acquisition. So that is, if you were using a camera to capture an image or like a video camera or something, um, the sensors that captured the data, so whether that be a digital, some sort of a, a CCD or something to capture digital images or whatever machinery or, or, or whatever was used to store the analog data, um, the any subsampling that occurred, and hence why we use the term subsampling and not just downscaling, actually happened when the image was captured. So the sensors for different colors would be at different resolutions. If you were capturing images in RGB format, you would have, and you had special sensors for green and blue and red, you might have the sensors be at a lower resolution for red and blue. So the subsampling would happen automatically as part of image capture. Um, we're doing it synthetically, so we're performing subsampling uh, ourselves, um, just to prove a point. Um, modern broadcast formats, I mentioned earlier that all of the TV you've ever watched has been subject to subsampling, unless you've been doing extremely like high definition video editing directly, because even HD video is subject to subsampling. Um, so modern formats typically scale down the two color planes, so CB and CR, by 50%. So, so they use uh, the, uh, one quarter as many pixels as they did before. Um, for historical reasons, subsampling techniques have strange names. So um, scaling down the two color planes by 50% is called 420 subsampling. I'm not gonna, gonna go into detail about why that name makes any sense. Um, there are other schemes like 422 or 421, and um, the naming has a lot to do with old, -fashioned, with old fashioned analog video and signal processing stuff. We're gonna leave it and just say 420 subsampling means you scale down CB and CR by 50%. That's enough for our purposes. Um, so as I said earlier, we are adopting a very simple scaling technique where if I've got, if I'm scaling down by a factor of two, I take a two by two group of pixels and merge them into one single pixel. So I, averaging, I average out a two by two region. There are a variety of other ways to do this that are clever. So one of them, of course, would be using a scaling technique where um, if I'm scaling a big image, I don't just average out a group of pixels to make a pixel. I could use some more intelligent technique that takes into account context. Obviously that would help, but we don't want 
want to use it in this lecture because we want to stick to just looking at the benefits and disadvantages of subsampling. There are also some clever tricks where if you're scaling two different color planes, you could scale them so the pixels are slightly offset. So for example, one color plane has pixels that line up like this, and the other color plane has pixels that line up a little bit differently. Um, and the reason why that's clever is that means the boundaries don't line up so that the sawtooth artifacts aren't as obvious because there are more boundaries and they're lining up at odd intervals and therefore that the, the impact of the artifacts is sort of diffused over a more area of the finished image. Um, that's also a neat technique. We're also not going to worry about that. So let's conclude by taking a look at some examples of subsampling at extremes in both RGB and YCBCR. We know that if we scale down stuff enough, we're going to have artifacts. The claim I want to make is that the artifacts are way less visible uh, and way less unpleasant in YCBCR. And therefore, we can get away with a lot more of a resolution reduction before we have a problem. So uh, here I am, I've scaled my red and blue planes down by a factor of 10. And we saw earlier, this results in ugliness. Okay, um, if I scale my CB and CR planes down by a factor of 10, I'm, I, I'm using the same amount of space. These two images use the same amount of space. This looks way better, way better. So among other things, I don't get the weird jagged sawtooth brightness infused artifacts that I did in the RGB version. They're gone. Look at that crisp edge on the edge of that piece of pineapple. That's wonderful. Um, I still have some artifacts. So you'll, you'll see um, on this boundary between a red region and a blue region, there is a visible pixelation. There is some pixelation hidden inside the pomegranate arrows, but it's not nearly as bad as the pixelation in the RGB version. Um, and look at the detail on the kiwi. So in the YCBCR version, the kiwis look perfect. I really don't see a problem with them. Um, in the RGB version, I get this weird pink ghosting effect showing up in a lot of places. It's not really obvious what it is, but there's something off about the kiwi. I also see visible pixelation and um, sawtooth artifacts on the edges of it. And again, there's the YCBCR version. It looks wonderful. Uh, here's an image of a grapefruit. You can ignore this, this green boundary. That is an artifact produced by the script that I used to generate this. So it's not actually a problem with the subsampling technique. It's, a, it's some sloppiness on my part to generate the example. It only happens on the boundary. Um, so if I subsample this grapefruit image with uh, scaling down R and, uh, R and B by a factor of 10, notice how the image itself doesn't really contain any obvious greens. Green is involved, certainly, in all of the colors used in the image, but the image seems to be sort of red heavy, and there are greens that participate in, in this orangey or yellowy texture on the outside of the grapefruit, but there aren't really any bright green colors. Also, we've got a bright background, and we saw earlier that can result in weird stuff happening around boundaries. And sure enough, if you zoom in on this, you notice something really weird, this sort of staining effect happening around the edges of the grapefruit. You also notice a sort of, it's not pixelation per se, but in the middle of each grapefruit slice, you can see something weird happening, little bright specks that are sort of square. We also notice very obvious jagged artifacts effects um, in areas between the background and the grapefruit. So there, you can see bits of brightness impeding on the grapefruit uh, up at the top. You can also see bits of brightness impeding on the dark shadow underneath the grapefruit down at the bottom. So all in all, if I subsample down to a factor of 10 with RGB, it looks pretty bad. It, it looks sort of ugly. Um, here it is with YCBCR. Look at that. Um, there are artifacts. There are tons of artifacts, but look at that. It looks so crisp by comparison. I do see a little bit of staining. You can see some sort of yellowish staining happening around the rind of the grapefruit, but it's not that noticeable. I have to look for it to find it. There are artifacts around the edge of the grapefruit, but because luminance is being maintained so well, I don't see them. They're just color artifacts, not brightness artifacts. There is some artifacting happening along this boundary here. That is sort of noticeable to a viewer casually. Somebody uh, who doesn't isn't looking for artifacts might see these sort of pointy intrusions into the background from the surface of the grapefruit, but that's the the only visible artifacting I can see is happening around here. Otherwise, it looks beautiful. Um, and remember, this takes the same amount of space as the other one. It's just a matter of choosing where I throw data away. Okay, and then finally, let's take another look at the pair. Um, so I've got the pair here, subsampled uh, by a factor of 10 in red and blue. Sure enough, some ugly stuff happening. We've seen this version several times by now. We can see all the ugliness. Here it is in YCBCR. Okay, so in this version, yes, we are noticing a pretty decent amount of artifacting happening um, down at the bottom of the pair. However, it's, I think, this is subjective, a bit more pleasant, and I'm able to preserve, I don't have the same mess occurring um, at um, boundaries between the bright background and 
and the foreground. There is still some artifacting happening around the edges of leaves, but it's not as noticeable. I'll see it if I look, but my eye isn't drawn to it the same way it's drawn to this really sort of tacky appearance um, of the background sort of oozing into the foreground as a result of the luminance getting scaled down in R and B. Okay, so subsampling is a big deal because once we know which color system to use, and there might be better ones than YCBCR for a particular purpose, we can push all of the important information into one color plane and scale down the others. We need to know subsampling because it plays into what JPEG does, and although we're not going to write a JPEG encoder, we're going to write image compression tools that are similar to JPEG in some ways. We want to know what it does, and so all JPEG images um, in general can be expected to be subsampled. You can turn off subsampling, uh, but generally that's an easy way of saving some bandwidth without compromising further on quality. And in particular, you could expect that you've seen subsampling many times in your life and haven't noticed because every TV show you've ever watched is very likely been the subject of either analog or digital subsampling, which is evidence that it's both a powerful um, and pretty convenient technique to save some information. Now in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the fundamental technique used to save space in JPEG, to discard information cleverly uh, in a way that doesn't compromise too much on detail. That's that intense topic I was talking about at, at the beginning. But we've had our break. We've looked at images of fruit salads for an hour or so, and so we've had a chance to relax. So we'll just have to buckle down and prepare ourselves for a pretty intense mathematical lecture next time.